Welcome everyone to another podcast from Still Point Radio. Wherever you may be, sit back, relax, tune in, don't tune out, and enjoy. I know you're gonna dig this. It's the freaky bees knees that you need to see to be free in the living tree of unity. It's the freaky bees knees that you need to see to be free in the living tree of unity. It's the freaky bees knees that you need to see to be free in the living tree of unity. It's the freaky bees knees that you need to see to be free, 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 free. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Anyone interested listening to some interesting article? Uh, I read this article from a friend of mine, actually, but I had no idea that he wrote stuff like this. I had no idea that he was this talented. I actually met this gentleman at a ceremony in South Dakota, and um, we became friends. And his name is Maxwell Goldman. We just happen to be on a similar journey, a similar path in, in, in some ways. Down the road, you know, he supported me, supported some of my, my book work. And then I found this article that he wrote, and it just, it really spoke to me. And it seems to be right on time, very poignant for, for today's culture in, in America, actually, and in the West, in the it's just a very interesting topic. It's called Where the Rubber Meets the Pavement, Fear and Loathing on the Medicine Path. And I'm going to I'm going to interview him. We're going to call him up here in a second and let him explain himself, let him talk about the points in this. This is a very short article, but really concise, some very poignant messages. He just seems to nail it. So Sit back and relax, and uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation about the current state of, I guess, psychology in the spiritual sphere, in the self-help sphere, in the personal development sphere, in the coaching sphere, whatever you want to call it. But there's a lot going on with technology that is affecting our egos, our personas, our personalities. And also, you know, the internet itself, doing what I'm doing right now, doing a podcast is part of this thing. So it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting dance that I'm doing here with this topic because it it applies to me. It also applies to the author of the article, Maxwell Goldman. It applies to all of us in the modern world, but it's, you know what, just sit back, relax and, and, and enjoy the ride. You can, you can definitely relate to this in some way, shape, or form. So, here we go. Maxwell Goldman, Where the Rubber Meets the Pavement, Fear and Loathing on the Medicine Path. All right, so I'm, I'm here with Max Goldman, the writer of this article called Where the Rubber Meets the Pavement. It's on uh, medium.com, and it looks like, Max has posted it or tweeted it and maybe maybe put it on other platforms. I'm not sure. Instagram, Facebook, that sort of thing. I'm going to read the first, you know, basic paragraph and and then we're going to talk to Max and just get his thoughts on where he's coming from, what his perspective is, why he wrote this article, and we're just going to dig into it. We're just going to see what happens. So, where the rubber meets the pavement, Max Goldman Fear and Loathing on the Medicine Path. I've decided to write this article in light of the fact that I keep running into the same problems with delusion and ego in the spiritual communities that I traverse. I like to say that the spiritual world culturally is filled with many, many psychophants and fetishizers who refuse to get real with themselves, covering their vulnerabilities with floral language and faux ornamentation. This is especially prevalent within the native world or within the Native American world of spirituality, i.e. Lakota as well as ayahuasca culture. All right, so we'll stop there and then uh, welcome Max. Uh, you know, you're the, you're the author of this article. Welcome to this, uh, this podcast. Oh, thank you so much. How are you doing tonight? Good. I'm uh, Good. having the tea and 
Talking to my good friend Ryan, what can be better? Yeah, exactly. Yep, in these strange, strange times. Yeah. Um, so when I read this article, and it's a short article, it's just, it's just so concise, and it just nails so many things that just spoke to me and jumped, jumped out at me. That's why, that's why I reached out to you and said, hey, you know, do you want to talk about this? And just that first paragraph that I just read relates, I relate to it myself, and I, I assume a lot of other people that are uh, within some sort of spiritual community or have participated in ceremony or some sort of medicine can relate to that first paragraph as well. Especially for me, the the ayahuasca culture, I see a lot of um, where I think this article's going. I see a lot of people that are just self-proclaimed, you know, self-proclaimed priestesses, priests, you know, shamans, maestros, ayahuasqueros, whatever you want to call them. But it's weird. It's like if someone puts on the garb and has the beads and then somehow provides you with uh, with the plant plant medicine, then all of a sudden people think they're qualified. What do you think about that? <clears throat> yeah, well, it's funny. You know, you mentioned the word shaman. Um what is a shaman? If somebody, you know, says, "Oh, I'm going to see my shaman," or, uh, "Yeah, have you heard of this shaman?" You know, or, you know, they're interested in shamanism. What is a shaman? And I always, you know, a shaman is a is a Siberian medicine man. So I always say, "Oh, so you're going to see a Siberian medicine man?" <laughs> you know, and yeah. obviously that's not the case. You know, and um, right. That's that's you know that's it in a, in a nutshell. Yeah, you know I'm a you know I'm a big word word smithy kind of guy. I like etymology. Uh, my understanding of the word it does it does come from Siberia, as far as I know. I I knew that, but my understanding of the word is that it means sh- sha refers to the spirit or or more precisely the breath. Uh, I've always been told that it means like the breath man or or the the spirit man, sure. someone who is in tune with the the life, you know, the yeah. the spirit is the life, the life force. So even though that word comes from Siberia, obviously it's been adopted into our culture. So yeah, I mean I I mean we could go to so many directions, but I know what you mean, you know, it's funny when people say I'm going to go see my shaman. Like it's their personal. Um, right. They, they slip know, it in thing. like, you know, very casually, like they're going to go see their psychic and then they're going to go see their shaman and then they're going to go get cupped and then they're going to go see, <laughs> you know, they're going to go see their accountant, you know, or they're going to go, they're going to go to their little, you know, cyclocross you know, and it's just the, that, that is, you know, that's the thing is that it's just this casual, uh, cultural approach to spirituality, which on one hand, it's good. You know, there's, you know, I'm not here to trying to knock anyone and, um, trying to better themselves and, you know, and trying to knock anyone from, you know, up, you know, let's say upgrading their or you know changing their belief system and um from you know people who are who are trying to learn a different way of life and and you know integrating that and and healing it's just this commodification uh that is uh so incredibly prevalent in let's say western contemporary uh "Quote unquote medicine culture that uh, you know people are borrowing and uh, from you know various uh, traditions and it's become a bit of a Broadway show and uh, you know it's a bit of an abomination from the root of what what these things really come from and you know the uh, traditions that they that are that are very old." that, you know, people are just superficially approaching these things. And, um, you know, I, I don't like to be very, you know, 
I don't want to judge, but the, you know, there is an aspect of it that is very, that's a bit sad and eyebrow raising. So I decided to write this article because I've been around that, you know, I sit in ceremonies. I've been living uh, back and forth between the U.S. and South America and, you know, have sat in EP and this, that, and the other, but I would never walk around and dare call myself a shaman. And matter of fact, I'm not anything. I'm just a guy. I happen to enjoy, uh, you know, and find meaning through these traditions. But God forbid anybody take that, uh, in, you know, take these sorts of things in vain. They're meant for us. You know, they're very personal. And uh, there's, it's disrespectful what, what I see. Yeah. Well, I've seen the same thing. You know, I've seen the same thing around around the Native American spirituality here in the United States. I've even seen it within their own culture. With it, I've seen natives do it to natives. You know, um, there is a strange... I mean, I guess this is just the human condition or human nature. I've seen where, you know, someone leading a sun dance will will talk about somebody else's Sundance and they'll say, well, this one is different because of this. And this one's not as good because of that, or they practice in a different way. And, uh, I don't like that. And so, I mean, I guess there's, you know, there's always personal preference, but what I've also noticed is that, and I think I might be, I might've done this even to you. I can't remember, but I know I've done this to a few other people, you know, my experience with Sundance and the, and the Plenty Wolf family, there's been a couple times where I've, I've talked about the Plenty Wolf family and I've, I've told a perfect stranger that's interested, Hey, you know what? This particular leader is the real deal. Like I, I, those words have come out of my mouth. And so when I read your article, it kind of made me check myself and go, Hmm. And I don't retract that statement. I, I do believe that, um, that the Plenty Wolf family is the real deal and their practices are um, they're dedicated they're committed they would live and die by this way of life and this spiritual philosophy but it's interesting to me that it's not my heritage it's not it's not my culture so that's one thing that i, I kind of maybe we can get into is why the traditional american has lost a, a great deal of their spiritual culture and then here I am, you know, finding solace in another, you know, ethnic group or an, another spiritual culture. And I, I tell myself and I've told others, oh, this is the real deal. And, you know, I do believe it is like I, I'm not I'm not like saying it's not. But I've also seen other people in my life describe whomever that they uh, revere. And they'll say, oh, this is the greatest shaman, and, you know, around. This is the, this is the real deal. This is the, th this guy or girl is like on a whole another level, you know. And um, in your article, you, you talk about how we fetishize and um, we put some of these people on a pedestal. You use this word, you know, psychophants. So I want you to, I know that's kind of a lot to unpack, but I want you to talk about what a psychophant is, or a psychophant. Sycophant. Uh, and what is, how do you say it? Sycophant. Okay, sycophant. Okay, so, so yeah, tell me what a sycophant is, and tell me what a fetishizer is, and tell me why you think this is happening in, um, in modernity here in the Western world. Yeah. So, all right. Um, sycophant. With the definition of it, let's see. The definition of a sycophant, if I were to look it up, is a person who acts obsequiously towards someone important in order to gain advantage. So ass kissing. Exactly. But <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, somebody that is looking to climb a social ladder. You know, and oh, yeah. um, so there, you know, one might find some, you know, certain individuals 
that are displaying sycophantic behavior to the chief, for instance. And it's not just like because you want to give the chief love. It's good to give the chief love. The chief, is, you know, has a lot of responsibility. But it's because you want to, yeah. maybe you want something. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, that's the, that's the shadow of, of the sick of the sycophantic behavior is the, I'm going to kiss this person's ass. Who's the individual who's in charge or who's in power because I want to get ahead or I want something and you know, it's a bit, mm, let's say, yeah, I've run into it before, you know, without getting into specifics because this uh, talk is going out into the public realm, but I have run into this behavior before. And, uh, you know, it's just, who are you fooling? You're going to kiss this guy's ass because you want to get ahead. Do you think that person can't see that? And you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the other, the, you know, and then, the, and then the other, uh, you know, and at, at the end of the day, what does that even mean? You want to get ahead? What do you want to be a chief? What do you really want out of this? What, what's the point for you? What do you, what's the point, you know? And, um, yep. and, you know, if we can show support to those who are in the captain's seat, let's say, and we can do it, you know, in a way that is mature and that's respectful from one human being to another. And, you know, I, it, you know, you brought up, you brought something up with what you were saying uh, or what, you know, what you said, which, which was. You know, why do we borrow or why are we honoring another culture? Because we are oftentimes, especially as Westerners, and you and I talked about this the other day, that, you know, we're, you know, we're cut off from what we come from. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about modes of prayer, especially earth-based prayer, and even though there are other cultures that have earth-based modes of prayer and their relationship to, let's say, the stars and that which lies beyond language, um, you know, it's humanistic. They're human beings. And I've run into, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, because I've lived pretty extensively in South America that, uh, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of the kids in those communities don't really care about their traditions anymore. They are on their phone all day long and they want to go out into the world and they have to go make a living. And, you know, they go to school or, you know, they go to college or they want a city job or they have no job and they just stay within the community, but they're not interested in what their, uh, you know, grandfather does which, you know, their grandfather, let's say, is a medicine man. So there is some good, you know, in preservation, as long as the Westerners know to approach with respect and take a grounded and, you know, uh, let's say, pragmatic approach to these modes of prayer so that they're just not getting lost in things, especially in their egos, and that's what leads to the fetishization of, you know, the Western approach to native modes of prayer. So now you're seeing people it, 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 because, of course, you know, we live in a very narcissistic society where narcissism is celebrated. Yeah, with you know, social media and just, you know, you name it, you know, you name it. We all know what yeah. narcissism yep. is and what it looks like in our society. You know, look, look at me. Everybody wants attention. You know, 
and you know so now you're walking around and you know if you're into yoga and you go to india once and now you come back and you're wearing your you know a sari or you know and you know look it's okay you you want to honor that thing that you're into but don't make that your whole identity so that everybody can look at you and think that oh now that guy has changed he's you know this that and the other you're just peacocking with that type of an attitude it's better to be humble the medicine is on the inside the prayers are on the inside of yourself you know it's not meant to be an advertisement you can honor something and you can be you could be respectful and humble and gentle and quiet about it it doesn't need to be in everybody's face and that is what the fetishization of any of this sort of thing is is that you just walk around and you you know you or whomever a person you know and they they have all the patterns and they wear all the shit and they have all the regalia but you know what they don't know anything and it's you know and it's in a sense like you know i just i don't want to blame anybody and i don't want to be too harsh in what i'm saying in my message because we're all just human beings you know but but it's a it it's naive so you know somebody needs to say something and nobody wants to talk about these sorts of things because i don't know perhaps they're a little critical and you know it's it's a, it can be it's a it's a little bit of a controversial uh subject matter yeah it certainly is but i think maybe this is why your article just spoke to me because it does need to be talked about you know there's so many things you said in there but uh, it's you know to to sound like uh what is it a cliche in some ways it's this like the idea of the noble savage right and I don't mean that in a in a uh, politically correct way, because we have romanticized, let's say the the native cultures here in America. Hollywood has romanticized them as if you know native people never did anything wrong. They just lived a completely truthful and honest life. But we all, with just you know reading one book in history, you'll find out that you know, their inhumane side is just as bad as everyone else's inhumane side. They practice torture, they practice slavery, you know, they they constantly warred with each other, they fought over lands, they colonized each other, you know, that's a big word these days. Oh my God, you know, the European colonized, uh, you know, lots of the world. Well, yeah, they did, and that's a terrible thing, but um, they brought a lot of good things with the colonization, like electricity and the car and the airplane and this computer that I'm using and this microphone. You know, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth amendments, that all came out of the Western mind. So colonization is a terrible thing. But colonization was going on everywhere in the world forever. Every land you go to, there's already somebody else there with a bigger stick holding it over somebody else. And then this whole idea of the noble savage, you know, we we always take that term and we, we push it on to, to say like a native culture in some land. Well, but that's the same thing that you could easily argue that, let's say the Vikings, you know, we have fetishized them. We have made them a romanticized version of a noble savage. And, and I'm guilty of it because those are my relatives, you know, I look, I look up to their triumphs, their shipbuilding, their, they make the best axes in the world, you know, some of the best carpentry in the world, some of the greatest navigators around the world, you know. So they've been fetishized in the same way. And I think you could go all around the world. You could, you could look at the samurai and you could, you know, fetishize that culture. You could, you can go into South America and, uh, you know, I, I find myself really interested in the Toltec culture. And I look at those people as, being incredibly wise and incredibly honest in their spiritual path so you know i might put them up on a pedestal so just i'm kind of going off here but it makes me think of uh of this scene in in the show vikings which i really liked where ragnar lothbrook the father has gone away and abandoned his whole village as a king he went away and like tried to kill himself and you know, he was in severe depression and then eventually 
he decided because he failed he failed at taking his own life he decided to come back to his village but he knew that when he did he would be ridiculed because he left everyone and of course he had to stand up to the rightful heir that would would be king while he's gone and that was his three sons and there's this beautiful scene where you know he goes up to his three sons and anybody else there and says all right i'm back i'm old but i'm still the strong silver back here who wants to challenge me you know who wants to be king and if, if you haven't seen it it might not have an impact on you but if you have seen it it's a really beautiful scene where you know the old man comes back and looks his kids in the in the eye and he hands them a weapon and says let's fight to the death if you if you think that you can be chief if you think you understand the responsibility of what it is to lead all these people every decision that you make is crucial and and everybody is going to criticize you if you make the wrong decision and also everybody's going to praise you if you make the right decision he's like are, are you you young bucks ready for that and of course they all back down you know and he reclaims his kingship yeah i mean i, I know i'm kind of going maybe <laughs> maybe off on a tangent but some of the things you said about about that made me think of those 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 things who wants to be king you know the who wants to be chief who wants to take on that role and and in the name of your article you know i'll tie it back is is where the rubber meets the pavement and that you're like getting you're just like really getting down to the practical pragmatic you even mentioned in your article the mundane you know you're like hey you know let me actually here i'll tie this all together i wrote this down you said something that really hit me you said uh the pebble is real the star is an illusion maybe you can jump off from there you yeah know, the pebble the thing that that's on the ground is yeah. real but the star is an illusion that's right so you know we we um we we you know we let's say we're on the path and the path is a journey yeah and uh we, you know, we have our romantic ideas about this heroic adventure that we're about to set forth to go on. An individual, I don't, whomever. You know, and they show up to the place which is essentially their Shangri-La, right? It's where they think, oh, this is going to be their, this is going to be, you know, this is it. I'm, I'm going to this place and I'm going to be with these people and I have this romantic idea behind all of it. And you show up and guess what? You're in the middle of the jungle no, nobody speaks your language. You're all by yourself. You can't communicate. You speak. You don't speak Spanish. It's hot every day. There's mosquitoes. Sure, people are kind, but you feel lonely. Maybe you get sick. You know, you question why you're there. You start to question your life. You know. It's not so romantic anymore, is it? You know, <laughs> if you're going to go and walk that path, then you better be realistic or you're going to find out for yourself that it's, you know, yeah, of course, it's nice hummingbirds and butterflies. We all love hummingbirds and butterflies. But, you know, the, the, but the reality is it's, you know, it could be hard. Of course, it is what you make of it, and and you know maybe you do find yourself in Fern Gully, and you're in that type of a situation. But I doubt it. You know, you know that's the, that's a fan right. that's a fantasy, Fern Gully. You know, look, of course, like there's beauty. We love nature, 
we all love nature and there's a beautiful 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 places in this world and there's lots of magic in those places but the the truth is is that you can go and sit in a ceremony and the rubber meeting the pavement is not that vision that you received when you drank a cup of ayahuasca or you know whatever medicine you're sitting with you know those visions that you that you might see that you are experiencing something that is beyond language in the astral you know something that is you know in very incredible and this that and the other of course that's amazing but what are you going to do with that you know that that is really it you know the truth of the matter is what is it few people come to their spiritual tradition there's a teacher that i was sitting with uh, sometimes occasionally is a buddhist teacher noah levine uh, from against the stream and he said something very poignant he said few people come to the pillow meaning the meditation pillow uh, few people come to the pillow with a with a car with a black card in their pocket meaning that most people are completely overdrawn in the karma bank and that is what brings them to their spiritual path few people show up already enlightened actually nobody does nobody shows up with a black card like that i mean hmm. we've got work to do that and we're very you know we have trauma we're human beings there's so much trauma in our societies and and you know in our broken you know with our broken some of us don't come from such good families you know or you, you, you know, and with a one size fits all school system, you know, and we're trying to figure it out. You know, a lot of us have have been very confused or misled or are operating under, you know, very self limiting belief systems, myself included, you know, and, you know, have been trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. You know, how do I fix this? You know, I don't feel whole. I don't feel good. I have this trauma, you know, depression, you know, whatever. The realities that we've been experiencing, the realities that bring us to go, you know, sit with some medicine that might bring us some respite. Of course, it's beautiful that we get to experience, you know, uh, you know, visions of, uh, you know, animals in, uh, entheogenic medicine ceremonies and uh you know like uh, fantasy realms and things along those lines but you know at the end of the day i really don't know if that really is real what i do know what is real is that i need to get up in the morning and make my bed and brush my teeth and do some work and go to the store and, you know, there's probably going to be other human beings that I'm coexisting with in the world. And what am I bringing with me after that? You know, am I being an asshole to people or am I making it a point to offer some sort of joy or love or kindness or, you know, just simply just quietly minding my own business and not bothering anybody? And what am I bringing to myself when I'm going out, when I'm waking up? You know, how am I acting with myself, you know, when, when, you know, somebody, uh, you know, mistreats me, how do I react to that? You know, that's the rubber meeting the pavement, you know, that is where, where we, you know, we begin practicing. What did we learn? You know, and that is what's real. What's raw is that we're vulnerable, you know, vulnerability is the path man yeah chop wood fetch water right <laughs> dude exactly like, carry like, that's right like, chop wood is, carry water before enlightenment chop wood carry water after enlightenment <laughs> yeah. chop wood carry water 
you know? <laughs> yeah, you said, so you, yeah, exactly. You just, I'm going to read another part of your article. It says it right here. You hit that. I get it. You drank a cup of medicine and experienced uh, the celestial and it, it showed you things and it changed your life forever. Many of us can say the same thing. And then your next statement is, who are you? And how you carry yourself is no better nor worse than anyone else. Just because you've experienced these states of being in consciousness does not make you better than anyone else. The medicine path, the spiritual path, whatever you want to call it, boils down to one thing. And here you, you just laid out there. It boils down to your personal philosophy. And that's a, a very simple statement, but, you know, to really let it sink in and to like live your life r really taking an inventory on like what is my 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 personal philosophy not the not the ones i've got from the books not the ones i got from the television not the one hollywood gave me but what's my real true when i'm alone with myself you know in times of of like vulnerability in times of vulnerability what what is my what are my tools? What is my, my true personal philosophy? And I think that you nailed it there. Like that's where the rubber meets the road, you know, and I, it's hard. It's hard for most people don't even engage in this process. They just ignore it. They don't even care about developing a concise answer to their life problems. They just act like they don't exist, but man, you can't grow if you do that. You have to develop, you have to have some sort of foundation and you kind of have to give it to yourself. You have to make it. Yeah, exactly. Your philosophy, your, your belief system, what do you believe in? You know, and um, how does that relate to your life experience? What is it that, you know, all right, so we're going and now we're, learning about karma and we're sitting with buddhist teachers all right well what does that mean you know now there's various understandings of what karma is you know one understanding which is uh, whatever happens to you that's your karma oh you have bad karma you got hit by a car you have bad karma because you must have done something so you deserve to get hit by a car that's pretty harsh you know but you know another way to look at it might be and you know well all right well somebody get yells at you now how uh how do you react to that do you engage or do you just act you know do you just thank them you know or be kind or <laughs> you know what where is your faith you know f you know faith is tight plays a role and um yeah so you know having a philosophy through faith and understanding you know allows us to be more let's say you know here's here's a buzzword compassionate because we're understanding we're not sitting there and being judgmental we can be understanding and you know uh through our philosophy, meaning the lens through which we experience and understand our environment, the world, reality, our minds, one another. And, uh, you know, um, where are we placing our weight with our philosophy? And this is something that I touch upon in, in, the, uh, in the article is, you know, is my weight on the astral, you know, is my weight on the, on, you know, the, on the, on the, on a fantasy, on a delusion or, or is my weight on what's in front of me? And, you know, of course there can be a balance between the two. I know how boring things can be when we're just placing our weight on the every day. It doesn't mean that we can't have a little magic in our lives. But, you know, it's, but, but <clears throat> you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of us really don't, really, you know, take the time to take inventory with our belief systems. And that is what, one of the things that matters the most. 
especially when we're on on some sort of a path and inevitably you're going to be challenged in your belief systems in this world if you live in this world right now and you just turn on the television your belief systems are i guarantee going to be challenged so you know what do you believe in yep. <laughs> well ba- okay here's the the la- one of the last parts of this paragraph i'll quote you again i'm not sure of the celestial but what i am sure of is the mundane the mundane is where the rubber meets the road the mundane is where the plane is landed. The mundane is everyday life. One's philosophy is their system of belief, and it colors everyday life. It informs his or her interaction with their take on reality. No one being better than any other, just different. So, you know, you, you're just, <laughs> you're really just bringing, man, I, I hate to harp on, uh, astrology but you know it's a wonderful beautiful fun thing to um engage with but in my understanding it's just a divination art and what that means is it's just a way in which we make projections that we can see ourselves with i think i think friedrich nietzsche said i can't quote him directly but he said you know if you still, what did he say? If you still see the stars as something above your head, you've lost or missed the key of knowledge. And what he's trying to say is, is that the stars are out there for sure. But for any human to pretend that they understand them and they understand how they do what they do, why they do what they do, when none of us have ever been there, you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. they're like, who knows how? Who knows what they're really like if you've never been there, right? And so he's saying, we've used those things. We've used the sky to navigate the world. We've used the sky to create language. We've used the sky to uh, project symbols that we can remember. We've used the sky to create myths and archetypes, which all that comes actually comes from within humans and we forget when we look up into the sky we forget that all the stories involved with the sky are not in the sky itself they came from from us they came from people so they're really just us you know and so what what i'm trying to say is the divination art is is like reading tea leaves it's like there is no knowledge in in the tea leaves there is no knowledge in the way that the coffee runs off the plate it's mm-hmm. how that event triggers your intuition in that moment and reminds you of you your true authentic spiritual self that's the divination art yeah, um, exactly. And so you, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, go on. Everything is, if everything is a mirror, then then everything reminds us of ourselves. Life is a hall of mirrors. So there's nothing wrong with astrology. You know, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting art. You know, it's a way for us also to learn about ourselves. But again, that's another thing that that I, people just take it and run with it, you know, and uh, fine. But just be careful with the delusions. You know, that is why I wrote this, because I keep running into people that think that they're living in the Lord of the Rings. They speak, you know, they think this is the Game of Thrones. They, you know, it's just, they speak like it's medieval times, you know. Oh, my beloved, you know, don't get me started. You know, 
but <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're saying, man. I know. Hey, just go to a yoga class in, in Southern California. I mean, you know, um, exactly. And, it's, and try to keep, try to keep, try to, yeah, try to keep a straight face in your yeah. mouth at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, and, and so, uh, Hey, you know what? That's cool. I have lots of friends that, that, you know, can do, you know, uh, astrological readings. I'm not against it. I think, you know, sometimes it's really cool. Uh, it's interesting. It, you know, it has to do with learning about ourselves for sure. Like, you know, there are various opinions. Maybe, you know, even if you were to talk to the people, you know, who live in the villages in South America, you ask them where they got their language from, they're going to tell you the plants taught them, you know, Maybe that's a mm-hmm. fantasy. Maybe that's not a fantasy. You know, it's you know, there's definitely some animism there. Definitely some mythology. You know, I you know, I know you from the Sundance. They talk about the the concept of oyate, which means that everything has a spirit. Our chief likes to say, you know, even a blade of grass and the rocks talk to each other and things like that. You know, um, uh. You know, it's all in the perhaps the pursuit of of a man's want and need to connect with his or her landscape because we have these minds that, you know, discern and think and have logic and, you know, uh, want to connect and, you know, that we connect with uh, life sometimes through story. But we have to just be really careful with the stories that we're believing and the stories that we're telling ourselves and especially communally and with one another, um, you know, uh, just to bring it around to the subject matter because we could end up getting more confused and making things way more complicated than they need to be and way more fantastic than they need to be. And, you know, like we just we're already coming to these things because things are complicated and confusing and you know we're trying to make sense of things and and you know now we're now we're taking on these personas and you know now we're you know uber spiritual and we have you know we're what you know we got the clothes and you know whatever We're talking like we're in the Lord of the Rings and we have now taken off our old mask, which was, you know, uh, our old identity and replaced it with a new identity, with a new mask and living in this fantasy still another fantasy. But like, why not just put it down and just chill? You know, it doesn't have. Well, it's it's so it's so difficult, you know, I mean, and I'm not going to pretend that I have figured out how to put it down myself. I understand the concept and I, I, I see myself chasing my own tail, you know, a lot. And I, I try to get out of my own way a lot, but I find myself in my own way a lot. And so I'm going to, you, you say right here also in the article about three, three fourths of the way down, um, not only is the mask worn for others, it's worn for oneself. That's very powerful. And you go on to say, the Broadway show that is your usage of feathers, beaded jewelry, native pattern clothing, and copal can operate as just that, a show. And the show is egoic. Your ego is not only there to fool the crowd of people who you socialize with, but it's also there to fool you behind closed doors. Perhaps one only cares to appear to be brilliant and shining as a luminous star. As beauteous as those things may be, they are not raw, they are not vulnerable, they are not the unpolished pebble. The unpolished pebble is ugly, it is rough and jagged, it is on the ground, it's in the dirt, it's stuck on the bottom of your shoe. The pebble is real, the star an illusion i mean that's just your your writing is just really good man it's really concise you know there's not there's not there's no ambiguity in what you're saying and it's hard to do what you, it's hard to write about something 
nuanced like this and, and just really pin it down. And I, I personally think you did a great job. You know, the mask is the mask is not only worn for others, but it's also worn for and for yourself. That's that's the definition of the super ego right there, you know, is, is needing social approval. The mask is the need for social approval. And it's it's a weird what do you call it pickle to be in because human beings are social creatures like we can't really very few of us can live health and be healthy without contact from other humans if it, there's just very few people that have that kind of you know that kind of mind state and so we have this deep social collective mind but it's also that same thing that causes the rise of of the super ego and and causes us to fool ourselves and not be not be authentic. Yeah, that's right. People just want to be long. And you know what? I'm I'm you know? I mean I'm reading all this right now, yeah. and I have I have feathers. <laughs> I have sage right here. I have eagle feathers here. I have. Uh, yeah, and where did your eagle feather? Um, you know, I have, I have an eagle feather, and guess what? I earned that feather. That feather was. You know, yeah, I, it was it, it was given to me as well. I didn't buy it. It was exactly. given to me by a sun dancer. It's, it's a meaning, you know what I mean? I have I too have one and I earned it, you know. It was gifted to me, you know, by someone. And uh yeah, but again, like it's not something that I'm just flaunting around, you know. It doesn't matter. Who cares? You know what matters? Being a good being a good person, <laughs> you know. In yes. being kind, showing up, being kind to yourself, taking care of your health, taking care of your mental health, showing up for others when you can, you know, these types of things, these types of things be, you know, try to be a good family member. I know it's hard. You know, my, one of my friends says to me, there's two things that are good for three days, fish and family. I, it's like, God, you're so right, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, but like this, you know, yeah, just that, that whole thing, just even behind closed doors and you're just people just making this big show for themselves. But then, you know, they want to form tribes and they want to be long and, you know, they call a community a tribe, you know, and whatever, that's fine. Call it what you want to call it. You know, there are many ways to refer to something that in essence is per potentially the same thing and also maybe different, but yeah, like, uh, who are you fooling? At the end of the day, you know, with your own egoic behavior, you know, because you walk around thinking that you're a little chief, you know, and you, in your, you know, you're just like a narcissist, you know, and, uh, you know, some of these people are, are, you know, and I, you know, they're just like afraid to be vulnerable. They have the same issues, but they just want to be seen. They want to be the teacher. They want to be the narcissist. Of, you know, they are the narcissist. They don't want to be, of, you know, of the bunch. Look at me. You know, now I'm the healer. Now I'm the teacher. Now I'm the leader. Now there's a hierarchy. You know, praise me. I'm, you know, uh, now I'm going to end and making money. Now I'm making money. You know, and dude, it's a sli it's slippery. You know, it could be, you know, the those those folks, man. That you know, they I've seen them. They could just be basically like no better than a used car salesman, if you ask me. Yep. Yep. Carlos Castaneda, or no, it might be. I think it is Carlos Castaneda, but it's in it's in Armando Torres's book, um, Encounters with an All Wall one of the mo most powerful books for me personally is that book, but he says he's talking about sorcerers, you know, I guess what we would call a shaman or, or a, a chief, a Nagual. And he said, the saddest thing in the world of sorcery is a sorcerer who thinks he himself is self important or thinks he, he himself is important, which really just that simple statement. It's like, 
even even when humans do extraordinary things and I can contest with my own life experience I've witnessed humans do things that I, I don't know how they do them they're unexplainable they are magical you know they affect the people around them in ways that there's just no there's no explanation it happens but there's no way to explain it and yet a really powerful person is only that person who knows that even if something extraordinary happened and they were the conduit that at the end of the day uh they're just a, they're just another person they're just another human being man or woman mm-hmm. they're going to die just like everybody else they got to put their pants on one leg at a time and you know the whole the whole thing the emperor has no clothes it's like their shit smells just like everybody else's you know yeah well like i was saying if i get on an airplane i'm going to defer to the captain of the plane but uh if i run into the captain of the plane at Trader Joe's or the farmer's market or whatever. Hey, that's just another person, you know. Maybe that person might be my friend too, you know. But uh, oh, there's a lot of like, you know, uh, pitfalls to the to this to this uh, <clears throat> to these ways, you know. Especially for the Westerner, lots of pitfalls and lots of, uh, you know like getting involved in you know relationships with people who are looking to be in power you know and taking <coughs> advantage and either in you know it it's very it's a very precarious world to uh navigate you know Uh, Because there's just a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, illusion, a lot of deception, a lot of people deceiving each other, a lot of people deceiving themselves. But on the other hand, like I was, you know, kind of stating earlier, there's a lot of good in it. You know, there's a lot of magic. There's a lot of wonder, learning, opportunities for growth. These things show up. And you have to deal with them. Hey, maybe that's good because now you're learning something. You know, maybe you're seeing th- through some bullshit that you couldn't see through before. Maybe you couldn't, you know, maybe you're recognizing something in yourself that you, you know, weren't, rec- you know, weren't able to see before. You know, that's it. Like we're turning over stones and seeing what's under the stones. You know, that is what's going on here, you know. And now, now, you know, and we're just working on it. We're just, you know, people. People are, you know, confused sometimes. You know, people have clarity too. I like to, you know, I, I just, I don't want to harp too hard on folks. But, you know, there are these issues and they need to be spoken about. But there is a lot of good in these ways as well. And, uh. You know, oh, and, yeah. and you know they are, me- and they're there for a reason. Yeah, no, the you know my my uh, search has, I think, some I'm guessing similar to yours has led me down many, many, many traditions, many paths. I've I've read a lot on different different ways, different walks, different paths, and I think. I think there's just something in your, in each person's like deep center that resonates with a certain style or a certain path at a certain stage of their growth. That path, you know, not every path is the, I think every path eventually leads to the same place, you know, the beginning and the end. Yeah, the that's time. what they say. But they don't, <laughs> they don't. Yeah, they but they don't they don't do it in the same way, you know. Some start at the end and and work to the to the beginning, and some start at the beginning and work to the end, and some have another sophisticated way of getting there. 
maybe okay maybe this kind of leads me to think talk about what we kind of touched on earlier is why do you think or what do you think why why are we in the west you know orphaned as a culture like why did we get so cut off to our spiritual traditions and i can also say that uh with you know with my research it's crystal clear that the european peoples had deep 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 roots into ancient spiritual techniques and spiritual traditions that kept them alive for I, I, I mean thousands and thousands and thousands of years and only recently like you know whatever the age of modernity is you know the last I don't know I don't know I'd say the last thousand five hundred years you know when we've entered into the industrial revolution and this high-tech world we're in now and the, the the machinery is a part of our lives only recently have we f like gotten the amnesia mm -hmm. you know and not every culture around the world I mean, a lot of cultures around the world have, have have not they don't have the same amnesia that we do but my so my question is what happened to us like why did we you know sever from our very very old and tried and true spiritual t teachings yeah geez that's a big question that's you know that's a huge conversation I, I, well look you know many of us in our families uh traveled over here from europe could have been at the tur turn of the century you know uh you know could have been uh you know i don't know within the last couple hundred years but um you know it's become uh people's belief systems you know they're you know oftentimes they're really right now if you ask if you ask a lot of people geez you know what do they believe in they believe in some tradition no you know what they believe in democracy TikTok democracy <laughs> you know they believe in their political yep, their, po their political identity they believe in you know the dollar bill you know they're trying to get ahead uh you know there is a shadow to capitalism for sure there are benefits as well for sure um you know but we have a lot, a lot of us don't know what we come from. We don't know who we come from. You know, we have been, you know, Stephen Jenkinson calls it a nation of orphans. We are orphaned in this nation and we're totally cut off from what we come from. And we don't know anything about our ancestors for, for the most part, most of us, the average individual you know, myself included, right. you know, we just know about like maybe as far back as our grandparents or our great grandparents. I can tell you that my great grandfather on my dad's side, uh, one of my great grandfathers was the lead viola in the NBC symphony orchestra in the 1940s who, you know, he, he, his name was Jacques and, uh, um, you know, my family's Polish, French, Russian, Jews who came over in the uh, 20s. But, um, you know, there has been, you know, of course, there are these uh, uh, services that we can uh, learn about our family trees and learn about our ancestry and stuff like that. And uh, I come from Jews. My family is Jewish, you know. So, but like, what were the real traditions with my family? What did I come from? Who do I come from? You know, what is my lineage? What are the lines that I come from? A lot of us are suffering amnesia, you know, and, uh, you know, with that, we're just trying to find some connection as, you know, as human beings, I think, you know, to whatever it is that we can connect with because it makes our life more meaningful and richer, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, 
again, we live in this society that we live in and it's very superficial. So having some meaning behind things, you know, and, you know, filling our hearts up and our souls and, you know, uh, you know, finding a, like a place to put weight in our faith because, you know, the church has betrayed everybody or, you know, whatever it is, like you just don't believe and I don't blame you or whomever, you know, so we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> That's why these the that the, yeah. the wisdom is wisdom is wisdom, you know. Good wisdom, a good teacher is a good teacher is a good teacher. You know, I don't care if you're, you know, Joe Schmo, or you're a high lama. You know, the good wisdom, you know, truth is truth. It comes from. Yeah. You know, the earth, you can trust the earth. You can't trust the politician. Politicians are going to lie to you. You can trust the earth, you know. The earth's not going to lie to you, you know. So if you're cut off from what you come from, and you know, then maybe that's okay because there are ways to connect, you know. And that's what we're all looking for, perhaps, you know on you know to various levels and various extents i don't know if i answered your question um, Jake, or not but you know <laughs> no you no, you did you did um um but i'm gonna i'm gonna do this jay krishnamurti quote jay krishnamurti says it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a sick society and you know he's not trying to be critical there he's trying to point out that you, you we we might be sick and not even know it you know I think now, I think now most people that have done, you know, any any genuine try at self development has has got to figure out that, you know, our society does have some serious illnesses going on. It doesn't mean that other societies are better and that they're any better, but we have to work with what we have. We have to take care of ourselves as individuals, uh, and in order to make our our culture, you know, thrive and be better. Yeah, that's right. Um, so at the end of your article, you do talk about, and, and throughout the article, you talk about cultivating tool, tools, ways to navigate through the stressors of our life, you know, developing sensibilities that will help us to, to help us move through this in a, in a healthy way. So, you might have already said this, but I'll just ask you, like, what do you think are the most practical things to do to, to create that connection to, you know, what, what can the everyday person listening to this take away from this conversation? There's lots of insights that we've nailed, but like, you know, when this thing ends, can they walk away and be like, okay, what am I going to do? You know, what action, what practical action would you suggest, if any, to, uh, you know, to someone listening. Practical in which way? Practical and just maintaining a sense of well-being or what do you mean exactly? I would say, I would say, I would say finding and staying on meaning because I, I do think that meaning, there's something about humans that without meaning, we, we, we pretty much, we pretty much go down, down in, uh, into hell and we never cut we know we rarely come back so maybe i'd say what what practical things would you suggest to keep people having strong meaning in their life and um also i would say what practical things yeah you know would you suggest all right to just keep people um out of the out of the ego like so much yes okay well first of all um getting outside more okay for me is very important just going outside you know and then i'll, I'll get yep. into that other stuff but i noticed during the uh during during uh lockdown and quarantine and stuff like that the people in my lives that were the most miserable that were the people that 
didn't have backyards or gardens and the people that were happier were the people that had a garden and you know that were putting their hands in the dirt and taking care of you know had plants to water and things like that you know so just getting outside that's so important you know um yep uh you know um but you know uh as far as as far as uh yeah okay questioning things all right so let's let's go into that okay so um you know i think it's really important you know if if people are uh yeah i'm sorry i was just sort of trying to figure out where i was going to go with the your with my answer and where were you, you know what you were asking exactly yeah so there is a teacher that uh you know, I think everybody should know about him. He he passed away, I believe, in the 80s. Um, he was one of the teachers who brought uh, Buddhism from Tibet uh, to the West, and uh, his name was uh, Chogyan Trungpa Rinpoche. And he wrote a couple books. Uh, uh, he wrote a number of books, actually. He also founded a school, a college, a university, called Naropa in Colorado. But he, uh, one of the books that he wrote is a book by him. It's called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. Um, you know, if you're seriously considering uh, going down some kind of a road or you're on that road, you know, on that path, you, you, know, live, you know, trying to live in these ways, you got to be you got to question everything and that's what that what that book is about it's about questioning things cutting through spiritual materialism spiritual materialism that's what we're talking about right now you know now yes. cutting through that shit you know cutting through that shit you know questioning it in i think it's chapter 1 or chapter 2 he says question everything Taking a skeptical approach to things. Question what your teacher is telling you. Question what your quote-unquote elder is telling you. Questioning what you're reading. Questioning things. You know, how are you going, you know, you got to chew your food before you swallow it. You know, you're going to be having a lot of, you know, ideas and concepts and notions and superstitions you know, running into very religious type folks, you know, who are very superstitious on any spiritual path, any religion, you know, is going to have its dogma, you know, question it, you know, because when you question things, then you get to the truth of the matter of things. And you be, you look at things from every perspective. So either you're going to prove what you've been presented as wrong or you're going to prove it as right, doesn't really matter, but you're going to see it for what it is. And so, you know, I think that folks need to, um, you know, if we're talking about taking a practical or a pragmatic approach to our, uh, you know, you know, uh, our growth, our transformation, our learning, our unlearning, our reparenting because of, you know, that we have come into, you know, families who had poor tools in that broken society and, you know, that sick society and whatnot, you know, um, questioning. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, so I really recommend, you know, this book. It's called, it's called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. And then there's another book that uh, that I that that was the sequel to that book, which is one of my Bibles, essentially. It's, and again, I'm talking about Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, uh, and it is called The Myth of Freedom. So, you know, it's hard to know what to think. It's hard to know how to question things, and also, you know, questioning ourselves too. So there's a couple books out there, and those are two really good ones that I think that everybody, you know, I don't think anybody should or should not do anything. Essentially, I don't like saying that, but these, but I recommend these books for people who are interested in getting to the bottom of the truth, you know. 
and you know for the sake of for the benefit for their own for the benefit for benefiting themselves you know and in turn others in leading more uh you know happier lives you know what's the point if we're not we're not you know finding some hap happiness through all of this too you know so excellent well i i don't like to uh tell people what they should and should not do either but i have one caveat anybody listening turn off your television please I think that people should do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, turn your TV off for sure. We're, <laughs> yeah. I agree. I mean, look, yes, there are things that you should and Go. should not do. You should not eat McDonald's, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go outside and turn off your You should go outside. That's what this podcast is all about. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And, and uh, you, you, well, should, you, yeah, should buy Ryan, you, know, you should buy Ryan's books too, for sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll cut that part out i'll i'll, I'll drop that i'll do cut it, that do out it. Um, thank you um i i also i'm gonna link this article to at the bottom of the uh the, the notes here and people should just go read this article it's so quick it says it's a seven minute read i think it's maybe even yeah it's about seven minutes but man you did such a a concise job of, of laying out these key points and uh, thanks for coming on and, and, you know, going through it, sifting through it and, and pulling out like some of the nuance in, in the, in what you wrote. And then for, from on my end, that's about it. That's all I have really. But if you have anything else you want to add, feel free. Yeah. Oh man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Or, or also, yep. also, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but also, if you want to tell people where they can find you, if you want to be found, you may or may not really want to be found. But eh. well, you know, you know websites I websites and links and things like you that. know, I really am not a big on social media. I don't really use it so much. So you know, there's that. You, you know, but uh, yeah, if you read the article and uh, you can probably, you might be able to uh, shoot me an email or a note through Medium um, or uh, yeah, if you can uh, send me an email, my, my email address is maxgoldman at protonmail.com and uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. That's fine. And um, also just uh, Ryan, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was um, really nice to be invited to to come and uh speak on these things with you and um uh, yeah just wishing everybody uh you know peace in their hearts and minds really you know we've all been through so much so i just wish you all peace in your heart and love and peace in your mind and that's it fantastic that's it that's that's great <laughs> Well, thank you, Max. Thanks for taking the time to come on, and um, we will we'll share this with, with like-minded people, and I think people will get something out of it. If you take the time to listen, it, it relates to the human condition and, uh, in so many ways. So excellent work, Max. Thank you very much. And um, Thank you, bro. Take care. You too. All right. Ad adios. <laughs>